Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining the Fostering Program Integrity for School-Based Services, How State Medicaid Agencies Can Help Local Education Agencies with Compliance Virtual Meeting. My name is Nicole Clark, and I'm a member of the Medicaid SBS Technical Assistance Center team. Our presentation today will be presented and facilitated by Selena Parguez and Caitlin Carney from the Medicaid SBS TAC team. Note, if you have questions throughout today's presentation, please use the Q&A feature located on the bottom of your screen to submit your questions. I will now turn it over to Selena to walk through our agenda and in introduce our guest speakers. Thank you, Nicole. During today's event, we'll be meeting today's state panelists from Michigan and then diving into three topics on fostering program integrity. Program integrity for school-based services, random moment time study compliance, and service documentation compliance. We'll provide a presentation for each topic, followed by a mini panel discussion with Michigan. We will then close out our time today with resources and upcoming events. There are a few lenses through which we can view program integrity. Our objectives for today include understanding program integrity for federal requirements and compliance, and considering how addressing program integrity can support healthy students and lead to better quality out quality outcomes. Our focus today is not everything LEAs need to know about compliance. Rather, it's about how state Medicaid agencies and state education agencies can support local education agencies in their compliance efforts. To support that objective, we'll be elevating those promising practices through our panel discussions with Michigan. As mentioned, we are joined by representatives from Michigan. First, we have Dr. Kevin Bauer. Dr. Bauer has been the Medicaid Policy Specialist for the Michigan School Services Program since 2012. Prior to that, he spent four years as that program's reimbursement auditor. He has been through OIG audits, the state plan amendment process, and worked closely with the Michigan Department of Education and Michigan Intermediate School Districts to maintain one of the country's most effective school Medicaid programs. Dr. Bauer is a past president of the National Alliance for Medicaid and Education, or NAME, and spent 25 years of service in the United States military before retiring in 2007. Welcome, Dr. Bauer. Thank you for being here. We're also lucky to have Shauna Dittman. Shauna has focused on special education for the past 18 years with areas of expertise in IDA compliance, Medicaid compliance, and technical assistance. Ms. Dittman is Monroe County Intermediate School District's Planner and Coordinator and Supervisor. She'll tell us more about that during our first panel. Finally, Shauna is also a longstanding member of the NAME leadership team and currently serves on the board as the president-elect. We're glad to have you here. So taking a glance at Michigan school-based services, Michigan implemented free care in 2019 and claims for direct services using a reconciled cost methodology, covering services such as occupational therapy, personal care, speech therapy, and many others listed to the right hand of the slide. The state uses a random moment in time study to support administrative and direct claiming with a one business day advance notice to three business days to respond. Great, we will now be diving into our first topic on program integrity for school-based services. When you think of program integrity and school-based services, you might just be thinking about being ready for an audit so your LEA does not own money back to the state Medicaid agency for services that cannot be verified. But program integrity also supports patient safety and quality of care while preventing fraud, waste, and abuse of federal funds. So what is the connection between quality of care and compliance activities? SMAs and CMS's Office of Inspector General may review claims, provider credentials, and service delivery information to better understand what services are being provided in schools, if they are delivered by a qualified provider, how students' health needs are being met, and ultimately the students' health outcomes. LEAs are critical to program integrity, because they gather the information state Medicaid agencies need to conduct this oversight. For example, LEAs must be able to provide evidence that supports a build service, claimed administrative activity, and or support a time study response. But program integrity is more than just for Medicaid. Professional licensing requirements and IDA documentation require similar information. We want you to see how compliance aligns with and is not in opposition to LEA's goals to support and nurture students. To explore this further, we're going to discuss examples of program integrity, risks, and mitigation strategies. But first, we know some of you might be thinking, we have vendors that do program compliance for us. However, LEAs are responsible for LEA compliance, even if vendors support the LEA through the RMTS, billing, and or cost reporting process. 
It can be easy to become overly dependent on vendors and not conduct routine program integrity activities or exercise proper vendor oversight. And it is vital that LEAs ensure that vendors complete their processes correctly. We'll touch on working with vendors again on slide 14. So how can LEAs support program integrity? One great approach is using a framework that identifies program risks and vulnerabilities, and then creates sustainable mitigating processes and strategies to address the risks. This slide shows an example of how to assess risk, vulnerability, and create mitigation measures. For the purposes of this presentation, we are naming risks as potential pitfalls or harms to the program, staff, or students. Vulnerabilities are the root causes or gaps that lead to the risk, and mitigation strategies are sustainable shifts, processes, or other approaches that addresses the vulnerabilities to lower the risk. Using this framework can help ground your program integrity and compliance activities, and we're going to run through this framework for each of our three topics. Program integrity for school-based services, random moment time study compliance, and service documentation compliance. One important point to note is that CMS's Office of Inspector General has made audit findings across all three of these topics that are likely to be reviewed again in the future. Related to service documentation, the OIG has gathered many findings over the years. In one state, they could not provide attendance records to show the student was in attendance on the day of service and therefore could not prove that the services had actually been performed. In other states that only covered IEP services, the state could not demonstrate the services that had been billed were written into the student's IEPs. In another, the state didn't collect enough identifying information about the students to produce the supporting documentation to demonstrate allowability. When auditing states RMTS, the OIG found that LEAs with different start and end times across schools provided only one schedule instead of multiple as required under the state's time study implementation plan. Since all hours in which allowable activities are performed must be included in the time study, this called into question the time study validity. Finally, for program integrity more broadly, the OIG found two states could not provide proof of provider license or that the staff member who required supervision received the supervision. This leads us to our first example of risk, vulnerability, and mitigation. Thinking through program integrity risks and vulnerabilities can help states work to build mitigation strategies that will support student health and SBS compliance. For example, there's a risk of harm to students and potential loss in Medicaid funds if provider licenses are not verified. Unlicensed providers can include providers with lapse licenses. Additionally, unallowable providers include those who are not receiving supervision as required by their clinical licensing body, or providers on the OIG's list of excluded individuals or entities, or LEIE, that may not participate in Medicaid and all other federal health care programs. To avoid or mitigate this risk, LEAs and SMAs need to have adequate processes to verify that providers are appropriately certified or licensed for the services performed and confirm they are not on the LEIE list. As shown on the screen, we are now going to dive into an example um, from Massachusetts. Following an OIG audit, Massachusetts introduced a mitigation strategy to prevent unlicensed providers from participating in the RMTS. The RMTS Participant List Management web-based system requires a license number, license type, and license expiration date to be submitted and kept current for all staff in positions where a license is required and at the state's direction. The RMTS vendor verifies the submitted information quarterly and a final time during the direct medical services cost report settlement process to ensure that no costs are included for any periods when an employee or contracted staff member did not meet licensure requirements. Now we're going to look at another state example from Michigan. Michigan has a resource dedicated to supporting LEA's compliance. Michigan created processes to ensure providers are adequately licensed for the services they provide. A dedicated person identifies providers under the direction of or supervision of a licensed provider. The state established procedures to meet policy requirements and routinely monitors provider oversight. These procedures help to verify provider licensure and prevent a risk of harm to students and or potential loss of Medicaid funds as mentioned previously. Here is another example of mitigation strategy, this time for cost report filing. As we all know, it's easy to make mistakes. Something as simple as mistyping a number or adding an extra zero can have a huge impact on cost reports that could result in overclaiming. LEAs have sometimes accidentally reported annual salaries as quarterly in cost reports. If the LEA or state does not catch this error, the mistake may result in overclaiming by as much as 
One strategy to mitigate this risk is to conduct a bird's eye view review to identify outliers and address data inconsistencies before submitting a cost report. This could be done manually by looking at the numbers or LEAs or states may be able to create a check in the cost report filing system to flag outliers or other unexpected results. We know that vendors are important partners for LEA submission of direct service claims, participation in the RMTS, and submission of cost reports. While they are key partners, the LEAs are responsible for the entirety of their claiming activities. In other words, even if LEAs work with vendors to assist with activities, the vendor is acting on the LEA's behalf and compliance is up to the LEA. LEAs can oversee their vendors and take an active role in compliance activities. By having processes in place to conduct quality assurance reviews of its vendor's work and ensure vendors are completing compliance checks prior to seeking reimbursement. Example LEA quality insurance practices include reviewing supporting documentation for claims that were submitted, spot checking RMTS participant lists and schedules to ensure accuracy, reviewing transportation claims to be sure mileage documentation matches and that the transportation claimed is for a specially adapted vehicle, and confirming salary and benefits costs claimed on admin or direct cost reports match HR records. LEA representatives should be sure they have a foundational understanding of the state SBS requirements and LEA processes. This means LEA staff should be able to answer key questions without assistance from their vendors. To support this, LEA staff should attend state trainings and review all state technical assistance materials. Although the focus of the session is on LEAs, we wanted to briefly highlight that this relationship and responsibility rings true at the state level as well. We hope as state Medicaid agencies, you have internal controls and conduct program integrity activities for your school-based service vendors. I will be now passing it over to my colleague, Caitlin, for the discussion portion of topic one. Thanks, Selena. So now that you've grounded us in the risk of vulnerability and mitigation framework, let's turn to our panelists from Michigan. So Kevin and, and Shauna, if you wanna, great to see you. Um, so on the slide, you'll see the discussion question. So we'll give everyone a moment to read the question and then I'll ask that we stop screen sharing so we can see um, folks a little bit bigger. All right, Kevin, you're from the Michigan Medicaid Agency, and Shauna, you're from the Monroe County Intermediate School District. So I know in Michigan, intermediate school districts can play different roles to support the LEAs. Can you tell us, Shauna, a little bit more about your role within the Monroe County ISD, what you do, including the aspects of your job that meet a state requirement like your Medicaid implementer hat that you wear? Yes. So the way it works for my county is that the intermediate school district provides um, programs and people. So some intermediate school districts or uh, regional education agencies or of the like in Michigan do not operate programs, but we do. So I'm going to speak to you just primarily about what I do do here. So we have programs that we operate in our local districts, of which we have nine. We also have some public school academies and some non-public schools. We provide services to all of those locations, as well as we're required to provide um, services to registered homeschools and things like that. So we have um, that we hire and deploy. We have occupational therapists, physical therapists, orientation and mobility specialists, vision consultants, um, deaf, hard of hearing consultants. We have um, music therapists, adaptive phys ed, so speech therapists. So you can see that we pretty much deploy any related service provider. We also hire behavioral health consultants. So when Michigan expanded programming, we hired and then we deploy those personnel also. We hire nurses, we deploy nurses. So we have a, a large body of people to support this work. Um, and then we do have programs in our local districts as well. So we have our self-contained programs, which we call local-based special education, are housed in some of our buildings. We do not have one in every building. So some students are transported uh, to other locations that are not their resident district. Um, we also have moderately cognitively impaired programming in two of our local districts. So students from any district that meet the eligibility would go there. Um, we have a center-based program on our campus for our students that are severely and multiply impaired. Um, we also operate a 
juvenile detention and treatment center of which I'm the principal. So that's another role that I have. So I do all of these other duties as assigned. I do not know when I had my interview, I think they were just like, hey, no one else applied because how could anyone really have experience in all of these things? So I spend most of my days in the world of IEP technical assistance and um, just compliance land. And then same thing, but with Medicaid. Uh, and then I do my other roles of supervising occupational therapists and physical therapists, and I'm the principal at the youth center. So lots of different things, but we also have special education supervisors and directors, and we have directors of our early childhood program and directors of our behavioral health consultants. So we have a lot of people and services that we are offering to our local districts. Wow. That is a lot going on that's under your oversight or that you're supporting. So in all of this work, as it relates to the, the school-based Medicaid part, um, can you tell us about a time where you, you identified an instance of non-compliance and how you discover those issues? Yes. So I will add that everybody has a person like me. So when I said that there are other intermediate school districts or RESAs that are doing um, similar things might look a little different, but everyone has a Shauna Dittman. So everyone has a person that is devoted to making sure that the Medicaid program is operating with integrity. So um, thank you for having me on with these 201 participants so I can tell on myself so when I first started, um, that was back in 2013 into this particular role. Remember how I said, I don't know how I got this job. I had never had any experience with Medicaid, <laughs> but um, through a review process, I'm like, well, I don't really know where to start. Let's start with just looking at some claims that were paid. And so we took a few claims from a paid from a report that I got like a giant stack into my office of paid claims. Let's just start there. So then we kind of just followed the breadcrumbs back to see what was going on. So we picked personal care providers because they have the most turnover and um, we have lots of personal care providers on campus at our center-based program so they're accessible people. So if we do find something we need to train, we can do it easily, we can do it quickly. Um, and we employ them so we can um, have access to and really just tell them here's how it, it, it needs to be. So that was kind of a low-hanging fruit for us. So what we discovered was um, somebody went out on FMLA and then um, when they returned, they said, um, Okay, so how do I document these services, these personal care services? I said, um, you need a training for you're not remembering how to do that from when you were off on FMLA to where you are now. No, no, no. From when I was on FMLA, how my sub didn't document the, the personal care services. I said, oh, good, because you can't. I mean, that person never went on to the staff pool list, um, but you were not present to provide personal care services. Therefore, we're not going to say that you personally, the person on the staff pool list was providing personal care. Now, would we document that the student received personal care per their plan of care? Yes, but we're not going to report that to Medicaid. So because that person said that, and because I had that paid claims report, we opted to go ahead and do a little bit of a dive we picked 20 more claims and kind of followed the trail just to make sure the person was in attendance, that all the things were in place. The person was in attendance. The student was in attendance. We had a personal care authorization on file. So um, it's listed in the IEP. Um, it's, you know, approved by the correct personnel. So we conducted that and then we did end up providing a training because, you know, once one person says something, it's like, ooh, someone else is probably thinking that they too should be documenting personal care for the sub that provided personal care. But really it is about the person on the staff pool list being the one providing the service on the given day. Just like they wouldn't be able to answer an RMTS. If they did, they would say, I was not in attendance on that day. Okay, we're also not going to claim the service then, right? So I thought it was kind of a given, but it turns out it wasn't. So we did provide the training. Now for any new person that comes in, um, onto the staff pool list, they receive written communication as well as a video training, as well as a personalized training. So ways to mitigate. That was a fantastic example. And I love that you were able to look at it before it was billed to Medicaid and you communicated with them and you um, 
you know, targeted personal care providers because of that high turnover rate um, and put some things into place to hopefully prevent it from happening again. Kevin, is there anything else you would like to add from a state perspective before we move on to some other program integrity related topics? Sure. Um, one thing that we require is we require a quality assurance plan. And part of that is that the ISDs self audit um, along the way. But we also have our desk audits that take place when we have cost reports submitted and we have field auditors as well. We have a field auditor that goes off of the financials that are filed. And then we also have a field auditor that goes off the claims and backtracks those to, um, you know, provider certifications and things like that. So sometimes it feels like you're kind of audited to death, but um, fortunately the auditing that takes place when we did have our, our most recent OIG audit, we had very minimal findings. So I, I think that's, you know, an indication of the fact that our ISDs are auditing internally, then we're in turn auditing um, on, at the state level. So. Awesome. And so do you feel like having that requirement for the quality assurance plan makes a difference? Or do you think that's something that helps you set the LEAs up for success with their compliance kind of journey? I, I believe so. I mean, it it requires that they go in, they take a look at what they're doing, and they are probably the best qualified to find out where there's a weakness in their own system, you know, rather than us coming in and, and doing it. So so I think the um, the self-audit that we do is is definitely a keystone of, of our success. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think inviting folks to think through these things, like you're asking them to do through this auditing or this quality assurance plan, I feel like thinking through it is like, is, I don't want to say half the work, but that's, you know, that's really needed to get it started before you can take into action. You got to do the work that both of you have been talking about to identify where that action may be needed or to investigate, to figure it out. Um, and so Shauna, coming back to you from, can you talk a little bit about when LEAs do work with vendors, how they double check in addition to the vendor checks? I think you you get some kind of reports that you look at separately. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we have a system in place. We use what it's a, it's called Basecamp. I don't know. It's really just a communication system. But when we discover some type of anomaly, so if we're looking at a paid claims report, or if we're even looking at our eligibility report and we're seeing a drastic change in numbers somewhere, then we can dig into those and say, hey, something's not right. Some There's a communication piece that's missing between our export and our import between systems. Um, maybe it's the Medicaid ID is not showing up or um, the IEP date is field is blank or not pulling the newest or most recent IEP or something like that. So um, we could look maybe at our paid claims and if we see a lot that say IEP or pending IEP as the reason it's not paid, then we can dig in. Well, is it an anomaly with just a few kids? Is it a larger, is it a more global issue? Um, so we can kind of catch things in that way. Um, we also look at, um, we spend a lot of time, I think we spend the bulk of our time looking between those two reports, the paid claims and the eligibility reports, because it seems to be where we catch the most quick errors, but we're connected with other um, intermediate school districts that are using the same systems as we are. So if someone else catches something, then they could put it into the system and say, hey, is anyone else experiencing this issue? Uh, what are you finding? And so um, we do a lot to align um, like billable codes and um, requirements of the program, just making sure everyone's kind of on the same page regionally as well that are using the same system. So we kind of help each other out too. That's super smart. So it's looking at the data you have available, but also not reinventing the wheel too much and drawing on the expertise of your contemporaries and other um, ISDs. Awesome. Thank you both for your thoughtful answers. And, and so we're going to go to the next topic. I'll hand it back to Selena and then we'll come back for another little mini panel. Great. Thank you so much, Caitlin. And thank you to you both, Kevin and Shauna, for answering um, our first panel discussion. We'll be now turning to topic two, compliance for RMTS. Overall, the LEA is responsible for ensuring compliance and appropriate oversight of practitioners' participation in the RMTS. 
SMAs must therefore provide comprehensive training materials to ensure LEAs have the information needed to ensure compliance and that RMTS participants receive the information. Here is an overview of the LEA role for the RMTS, including highlights from the comprehensive guide. LEAs support operational participation in the time study, such as meeting deadlines for participant lists, identify appropriate staff who are reasonably expected to provide Medicaid reimbursable services, ensure participant lists are correct, check and maintain that work schedules and email addresses are correct, and ensure participants are responding within the same time window described in the state's time study implementation plan. As a reminder, if 85% response rate is not achieved, non-responses are included and coded as non-Medicaid, thus reducing reimbursement across all LEAs participating in the RMTS. One LEA requirement worth highlighting is that LEAs must maintain documentation that can be provided in an audit. As there is high turnover of providers, LEAs cannot easily go back and ask a provider what they were doing to verify a moment. Each RMTS response must be robust enough to be properly coded to support reimbursement. Maintaining documentation also helps the child smoothly transition between services provided. We have an example to the right of the slide, first of an undetailed uh, response, which is I was talking with a student's parent. Below that is an example of a detailed response. Following recent treatment of a student, I coordinated the child's care with the parent and referred them to an outpatient behavioral health provider who could likely provide the more intensive therapy the student needs. In this detailed response, they're using language that correlates with allowable admin activities like care coordination and referral. It helps us and the RMTS coders understand the why of the conversation between the RMTS participant and the child's parent. Let's use Hawaii as an example for risk and mitigation for RMTS. A risk is the RMTS response rate dipping below 85%. All non-responses will be included and coded as non-Medicaid. In Hawaii, they found their response rates were at risk for not hitting the 85%, therefore leaving the state's federal claiming vulnerable. To mitigate this, Hawaii figured out how to use its data in an actionable way. They developed a dashboard, which they called the Live Moments Report, to identify individuals who weren't answering moments and still had time to respond. They then worked with the superintendents to send emails to the RMTS participants who were late but still had time to respond to their moments. As you can imagine, the rates of response dramatically increased after this effort. I'll be now passing it back to my colleague, Kaylin, for the facilitated discussion portion for RMTS compliance. Awesome, we're back. Okay, so here are the questions again for um, this kind of RMTS section. And then Kevin, if you wanna come back and if we wanna pause the screen sharing. Um, so speaking of the response rate requirements on the last slide, Shauna, can you tell us about how you help make sure RMTS participants are responding to their moments so they can stay compliant or so you can stay compliant as a district with the response rate requirements? Yes, we when anyone comes onto the staff pool list, I I send um, messages all the time, but I send at the onset of their um, entrance onto the staff pool list, I send them a message that's like, congratulations, you've made the list. And it's specific to their role. So each person would get something about the requirements of the program. So administrative outreach gets one type of email that explains to them about their job, what the requirements are, and what um, the other part of the program is receiving RMTS and why they would receive RMTS and what that does for the state and things like that. So it's a, a written explanation. Um, and I would do that for each different staff pool um, list member. And then I would also go so far as to uh, provide a training. We, I have video modules and things like that. Um, we, we at the time that a person receives their moment, they get a lot of notifications. They get notifications directly from our state vendor, but they also get a no notification from my admin assistant. And it does re just reattach, you know, here's what this means. This is the response time. Um, here is a 
tip sheet for you to refer to. Um, and then they would get another reminder. So they get like a 24 hour, like it's been 24 hours. You didn't respond. They get a, like a six hour, an eight hour. I don't know. They get all of these, they get all of these reminders. And so if you hound people enough, they'll do their moment. That's the moral of the story, you know, just keep at it. Um, every now and again, I mean, every now and again, I do have someone that says, um, you know, thank you. I've been on the staff pool list a long time. You can take me off now, <laughs> you know, and then I just kindly remind them, you know, what, what the program is and why their district selected them and um, something like that. Now, when people get two in a day, they're like, why are you picking on me? So then I just have to remind them the word random. We know what the word random means. And then again, just what this means for the state, what this means for all of your colleagues across the state of Michigan. And moment. That's all we can ask of you. There's no, I don't need to coach you. I don't need to tell you what to say because they're seriously just asking you what you were doing at that time of day. So all you have to do is answer honestly. That is the most appropriate response. So, um, you know, and then I just tell them, make sure that they give enough information so that somebody who's unfamiliar with maybe special education or Medicaid could understand also what they were doing at the time. So, I mean, there's that. I mean, other than just trying to front load with training and remind them at the time and provide the resources, um, I, those are the top strategies. And then answering individual questions as they come up. If somebody is consistently non-compliant, then I might go so far as to reach out to either their direct supervisor or even the business office person that said that they were adding the person to the staff pool list. I might say, um, is the person no longer performing the duties that we agreed upon that made them members of this list to begin with? Perhaps their role has changed or you know, maybe there's been an error with their addition to the staff pool list. That's no problem. I can take them off at any time. We'll leave the vacancy for you for when you fill the position with the appropriate personnel. And that usually catches people's attention to, wait, whoa, 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 what? Nope, nothing has changed. I'll get them to do their moment. I'm on it. So you can do that too if you have to. But I try to do that as a last resort. I can usually resolve things um, directly with people. Yeah. Sounds like you deploy a lot of different strategies. And I do like the last one that you mentioned too, because it does create a bit of a feedback loop. If the if the list really is outdated, then you can update it. And that also maintains the RMTS integrity for really for the whole state to make sure that only the correct people are, are really listed. It um, would be hard because where I am is uh, relatively small compared to some of my uh, partners in the state. So I only have nine local school districts, but um, I see every person that goes onto the list and actually they report to me and I am the one who manually inputs. So I know darn well that these people are supposed to be on there. So, you know, it's a little bit like, oh, maybe something changed and you forgot to tell me because sometimes people do wait when the quarter opens, but usually where people are good about direct replacements throughout the year. But sometimes people do forget every now and again, it's, um, you know, somebody truly did come off or maybe they're on FMLA and the district forgot to notify me or something like that. So that does happen. Um, it's not always just a deliberate non-compliance, you know, people try to do good work usually. So. Got it. Kevin, do you have anything to add from your perspective? Yeah. From the state level, we do, we do have a conference every year. Plus we have our random moment time study training and things like that every year that goes out. And the one thing we always stress is, you know, when it comes to talking about RMTS, we're not going to coach answers or things like that, but we make sure that they know to answer the question completely as possible for what they were doing during that one minute of time. And that is the important thing because what you see is you'll start seeing people expound on that. And it's like, no, we need what you did in that one minute, what sp specifically that you did in that one minute, not, um, not in a general term, but what narrows down your, your exact activity during that time. Um, the best question I've seen from a provider on the random uh, not about the random moment time study was I got an email that said, my husband is the state Medicaid director. Do I still have to do this? Yes. <laughs> I, I thought that was pretty good though. <laughs> that's that's pretty funny. Awesome. And just since I do see some activity, wanted to raise that we do have the Q&A function and Shauna was just kind enough to, to answer a question in the 
in the chat too. So feel free to add those as they come to mind. Um, and so returning to the content of the responses themselves, right? So what does your state require to be included in that moment, one minute, actually one minute response? Um, and how did you decide on those requirements and where in state guidance are those requirements documented? Well, it's, we went through and we, we know what we have to have in that to identify what the moment is. You know, are you acting as part of how did you establish the medical necessity? You know, what were you doing? Who were you working with? Um, who was with you? Why are you doing it? Things like that. And it's all to get as much detail on that as you can. Um, that is laid out in our, our CMS approved implementation plan you know, for, for um, the questions that we're going to ask. And then we run the questions by and make sure that we're not leading or anything like that, because, you know, you, you don't want to, you want to be able to answer a question one way or the other. You can't direct an answer, if you will. Yeah. When you, did you ever have like that open format of like, what were you doing without those kind of probing questions? I'm, I'm curious and, and, or have your like questions evolved? And I'm just curious if that, you think has helped advance kind of the compliance or the the robustness of the of the answers. Yeah, we have we have some questions that have drop downs, you know, that give choices. But when you get to what was actually being done, the activity being performed, that is an open ended question, you know, because we want them to be absolutely able to put whatever they are doing in there. And there's no way with a drop down or anything that's directed, you're going to be able to to pick up every possible scenario that could be answered for that question. Shauna, you want to add on that a little bit? I know you're um, you're probably taking a lot more RMTS times and heard a lot more than I have on it. <laughs> yeah, I we, we do give some general guidance. Um, you know, we do discuss just the reality of each person's position within the organization. So um, with administrative outreach, for example, I actually, when people come onto the staff pool list, um, I send a form that says, um, these are activities that would be expected of someone on the administrative outreach staff pool list. Please check the one that describes your role the best. And then I actually have them sign and date and then they retain a copy and I retain a copy because then we're all on the same page about the types of work that that person would be doing. So when they're thinking about their RMTS, if they were engaging in any of those activities, I could say, refer to the form were you engaged in any of these types of activities? Because if that was is what was happening at the time of your moment, that's how you would want to answer. Um, if you were not doing one of those things, then just answer with what you were doing. And that's fine too, just as long as we get those submitted. So all everything is important. Um, no matter what you're doing, it's important to respond to the moment. But if you were doing something that you said you'd be doing, it's good, it's excellent for us, right? But I would, I don't tell them, um, I've just never said it's important that it looks a certain way. I've just said, if you were doing one of your activities, it's important to be specific about what that looked like. Um, and so we do give some guidance around that. Um, and we just have some discussions, but we have more like guiding questions. Um, we do not give potential like answers or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so you know, kind of, I guess you, you could, I think, do exemplars, but not specific to someone that received a moment, just sure. specific to roles, right, and responsibilities. So that's important. Um, so we do not have drop downs or anything. I think someone asked that in the um, Q&A. Um, we don't really do that. Um, we do, like if you're distinguishing between maybe was it an IEP service or not an IEP service, we would go so far as to let them choose between those types of things, but, sure. um, but not like a drop down of, were you doing one of these billable activities at the time? <laughs> we don't have anything like that. Sure. So, um, that's great. I don't, I have no idea if I answered your question. <laughs> I think that was helpful. Okay, Kevin, great. And then did you, it looks like you might be wanting to say something. No, like I was just going to reiterate that we do have, yeah. you know, the drop downs we have 
are there for, like Shauna said, you know, was it, was it part of the IEP IFSP? You know, that tells us that it goes towards um, our direct service claiming our old sure. special side. Uh, was it part of another plan of care, which would direct it to the C4S side of things or our free care as, as everybody else calls it? Um, or was yeah. medical necessity established in another method? And um, then the other yeah. one would be, you know, um, there was no medical necessity um, established. And obviously that has its own, you know, it's handled in a different way than it's a, a non-moment or rather a non-countable moment. But um, most of what yeah. we have is is enter because we want, we don't want to lead anybody down a path. That makes sense. Yeah, it's it's a fine line, but you, you're you both talking about, and this is helpful for keeping in mind, not only for the LEA's compliance, but also for the state Medicaid agencies. You want to provide prompting and guidance, but you don't want to provide coaching. And so it's very important to be intentional about what you say or what you don't say, what kind of examples you give. Um, so I really appreciate that kind of mind, mindful, intentional kind of approach to this. So we've gotten some really interesting questions in the chat. And so I'm going to combine two because I think it maybe it makes sense to answer them at the same time. If you want to answer them separately or need a reminder, let me know too. So what does Michigan require an LEA to keep for supporting documentation of work activities documented through the RMTS, especially admin activities. And then the second question is who creates the quality assurance plans at the LEAs? I didn't know if maybe it made sense to consider how they'd go about creating the quality assurance plan and including that. Um, but however, maybe Kevin, you start. Well, the quality assurance plan, you know, we allow the the ISDs to create their own. However, one thing that you hear us say frequently in Michigan is we plagiarize freely. Um, between you know the the ISDs, we don't believe in reinventing the wheel. We we do have a couple documents out there that have actually put on the um, top of them as stolen from another ISD. So that's kind of interesting when you see that it, they're having a little bit of fun with that, and I think that makes it you know go pretty easy. But there's a lot of sharing. There's a lot of communication in Michigan, whether it's between um, DHHS and MDE. And the ISDs or, or you know, where whichever way that information goes, and we're very connected. We kind of um, take it kind of from the national name model of, you know, the three-legged stools. We all have to be in this together. So there's a lot of communication, and that's really what, what helps us out a lot when it comes to things like this. So hence the, the plagiarism. <laughs> awesome. And with that, actually, I think we're going to move back to the presentation so we can learn a little bit more about service documentation. Always another favorite topic for consideration. Great. Thank you so much, Caitlin. And thank you all for the engagement in the question and answer chat and for um, the answers by the panelists. As you know, LEAs oversee all school-based services provided by staff and contracted providers who have different differing specialty schedules and con contract requirements. From an SMA perspective, LEA compliance with service documentation is crucial for providing safe and quality care for patients and students. FFP claiming and to prevent recruitments from the Medicaid agency in the event of a financial management review or audit. The comprehensive guide outlines the overlap between medical service documentation and educational documentation that can be consolidated or reconciled into a more efficient document process. Examples include that LEAs can mitigate risk to program integrity and quality of care by using service documentation for provider oversight, provide explicit guidelines for provider licensure requirements, provide instruction to providers on the types of documentation required to maintain a record of services provided and administrative costs, and use service documentation to monitor patient progress and outcomes and to assess the quality of services being provided. As a reminder, the comprehensive guide includes a table of documentation requirements as required by CMS and IDEA. States may require additional documentation elements beyond what is on this table, which can be found on page 89 of the guide. We know that one of the concerns frequently raised about service documentation is fear of administrative burden. Sharing this table or creating your own that includes state-level documentation requirements could be useful to help show LEAs that the requirements aren't that different. Finally, looking at an example of risk mitigation for direct service documentation. The risk is service documentation may not sufficiently ascertain exactly what service was performed. The identified vulnerability is claiming for unallowable costs because if the service cannot be validated, then services must be considered unallowable. 
To mitigate this risk and vulnerability, states can implement a check prior to submitting the fee-for-service or interim claim to validate the service documentation adequately depicts the service performed. So if you think about what those checks might require, it could be date of service, service name and clinical notes that say where the service was performed, which could be in school, in the child's home, or via telehealth, main themes discussed in any interventions used, and relevant statements on the progress made against any goals. I'll be now passing it back to my colleague, Caitlin, for the discussion portion related to direct service documentation and compliance. Great. Thank you. I can't actually believe that we're on our last panel already. I just did a double take when I looked at the time, but, um, but we have the right amount of time to discuss this, I think. So um, why don't we pause the screen share? And Kevin, I have a question for you. And there's kind of a lot of different components. So also let me know if you want me to repeat back or break it into smaller chunks. Yeah, but before really... we go into that, can I answer oh, yeah. one of the questions that was in the in the asked questions? And that is Michigan does not require prior authorization for OTPT or any services in the school. Um, that's specifically spelled out in, in our um, policy that we do not require pre-auth for school school services. So that's that's um, one thing that we don't. And, and the other part of that question was, have we been required by CMS to um, use the ordering and referring physician, the MPI of the actual um, physician that authorized? And we do use that. We do use that physician as the ordering and referring. Okay. Thanks for elaborating on that. Um, so from your state agency perspective, can you talk about how you help LEAs overcome their, their barriers to service documentation compliance? So there's a lot of them. So here are some different barriers to consider. So there's the operational processes, such as record keeping software. What happens to service documentation after employees leave and turn over? Um, what about the reality that LEAs face capacity constraints to support the claiming process? And finally, making sure, you know, these, these requirements are not always straightforward. Um, and so making sure that LEAs and practitioners like really get it and understand the requirements too. Yeah, I think, I think Shauna can testify here that, you know, we, we talk about how well, this is not just a Medicaid requirement. It is a practice of care requirement. You know, you, you need to document Part of what we have for support is we have our MMIS system, or CHAMPS as we call it, where we can pull up the, the services that have been billed through that. So we're a big fan of using that to um, to support the service. And um, that is the biggest thing that we have. Of course, you always have, um, you know, as far as providers moving on, that become, you know, we keep that as the school record and, and Shauna can probably talk about that a little bit better than I can of how they retain records. But, you know, as we move forward with retaining electronic records, you know, it becomes a lot easier. We actually had one of our, we did lose some records at one point because we had an ISD that burned down along the way. And um, unfortunately, a lot of their, their information was lost for a time frame. So wow. electronic is nice. Yeah. Shauna, do you want to expand on this? And then Kevin, if you think it makes sense afterwards to kind of talk a little bit more about how you try and like reinforce whatever Shauna says, that could be helpful too, to kind of balance the LEA perspective and how like, right, how SMAs like yourself can really like support <laughs> these hardworking ISDs and LEAs. Yes, I, I really could give a full day presentation on the nature of documentation and the importance and value of it. And if you ask any attorney, I think they would also love to talk to you for a whole day about how important documentation and data is. But I will just try to be brief for the sake of time. What I tell all of my providers is I do not believe um, their licensing agency um, would probably back me up on this. There is not a field that you can go into um, the types of providers we're working with, that there is not a place where you could go where there would not be a documentation requirement. So you cannot do home health or hospital care, or um, you cannot work in a nursing home. I mean, there's just nowhere to go where there would not be a documentation requirement. Now, the reason behind our documentation in a school, um, it should be deeply rooted in progress. Um, so we are constantly looking at progress on, on most recent goals and objectives and progress in 
educational settings. So from that lens, in what way are you able to show progress, if not with documentation? So that's number one. I mean, the the only way to gather reliable and valid data is by taking um, good case notes and then making sense of those notes um, using the documentation method that you described in your plan of care, which generally is um, provider record, right? Or like documented observation, that type of thing. So that's the first, um, you have to be able to show progress and growth. Um, and because of the student, you also have to be able to address lack of progress in the school setting for students. Um, same thing with our expanded program. You have to have a short-term and long-term goal. Like how, what are you going to do? And at what point can we discontinue services for the student? Our goal is to remediate and get kids back to, um, you know, their kind of their normal baseline. But for students with disabilities, we certainly um, are looking at how are we meeting those goals and then moving on to the next skill gap. So, um, I, Documentation is number one, and that should be for all students. Um, there's also no way to write a reasonable present level of academic achievement and functional performance or a present level of a student in general without documentation. So we have to be priming ourselves and putting ourselves in good positions for that work because that's our call to action. Um, it's an accountability piece, right? And then from there, Medicaid is really just like a cherry on top because now we can um, say that these people are doing this work and claim a portion of their salary and benefits for doing this work. So it's like just a recognition that, yes, we are providing these, these um, medically necessary services might be in the school setting, but this is where they're accessing the service from the school lens. So this is just a little bit of a bonus. Um, and Well, not a little bit. We we bring in a lot um, in this program, don't we, Kevin? I shouldn't say a little bit. We're doing great. So that schools, um, you know, in an age where we're constantly concerned and worried about funding, um, that in itself is, is a very critical, this is a very critical program. And without this program, that would, we would take a huge loss. So, um, you know, I just think it's important to kind of think like if we're approaching it from the lens of all children deserve to have educational outcomes um, and we are accountable for that, I, I think it's very hard to argue. Um, and we have everyone do all kids electronically for all the reasons that have already been mentioned. Um, we're not going to separate out due to um you know, discriminatory reasons, we're not going to say, well, we'll keep better documentation on this group of kids versus this group of kids, just all we're documenting for all kids, because that's what our license says to do. That's what IDEA expects us to do. Um, so for all those reasons, but. I love that. I don't know how often we say that Medicaid is the cherry on top, but I hope we do more <laughs> because, you know, you did a really great job there of connecting like the service documentation requirements with comp with um, quality of care. Like this is part of what it means to be providing care to students and it's going to help them for all the reasons that folks are in there providing care to students. And then if you do that, then you can get this, this extra cherry on top and, and revenue from the school-based Medicaid program. Um, really concretely with the, you just mentioned electronic health records. So um, is it safe to assume that everyone records there so there's not an issue, let's say, with someone leaving because they don't take their paper notes with them or throw them in the bin um, if, if uh, there's staff turnover? And then is it different at all for, let's say, I know there's a lot of um, claiming that Michigan does for behavioral health services, including outside of an IEP. Is that treated differently in terms of documentation or um, just curious on your thoughts there? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's not different from where I spend my days. Um, everybody and our behavioral health providers would find it critical to look for progress, um, even if it's just in little increments. So um, they actually, what I found is that people that come from clinical settings, when we talk about documentation, they're like, well, yeah, I mean, but people who have lived in education and that's the only field they've ever been in for whatever reason, that is a tough crowd. I mean, you really have to remind them, oh, it's your professionalism. This is your licensing requirement. You know, here's what your professional organization organization has to say about that. It's on their very own website, how you have to be documenting your service. So, you know, I just kind of point people back to 
their um, own professionalism in those cases. Yeah. But yeah, the expectation would be the same just for all students receiving services, yeah. just like if they had a health care plan or if we had to say that they were receiving accommodations through a 504, you have to show that you are, in fact, providing those things. So how are you going to do mm -hmm. that? Um, and if I am in a state complaint situation or an OCR complaint situation or a Medicaid audit situation, um, where am I going to look? If it's not easy for me to find, then we have a problem. So I do check for those things. We do fidelity sure. checks here. It's part of our quality assurance. But um, I do that for IEP and uh, um, Medicaid. So it's kind of like easy for me because I can tell right away, like, oh, we're yeah. hitting the mark on this one, but we're not on this one. So. Yeah. That's one of the things we were very intentional about when we when we designed the expansion portion of the program is we wanted to keep as many of the the requirements the same as what it was for our existing program because we didn't want people having to go back to the book and go, what do we have to keep for this person? What do we have to keep for this student? We wanted to be consistent about every student out there having a similar um, type of information necessary. I love that. And we're ending, we're going to have to wrap up, but I love that we're also ending on like equity and equality and making sure that kids get their care and are treated equally and how Medicaid can really, Medicaid and Medicaid compliance can be used as a way to propel kids to be right, healthier, better able to access their education. Like that's what it's all about. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it back to Nicole to wrap us up. Thank you both so much for, for sharing all of your insights. I know I've learned a lot and I'm sure everyone else has too. And thank you for having us. Yes, thank you. Great, thank you so much. <clears throat> we just wanna note for a moment some of the upcoming events that the Medicaid SBS TAC team will be hosting. On March 28th, 2024, we will be hosting a virtual meeting focused on using health services initiatives, HSIs, to support healthier kids in schools. Additionally, on April 25th, 2024, we will be hosting a webinar about providing about provider billing for mental health services. Please feel free to reach out to the school-based services at cms.hhs.gov email address if you would like to be added to the distribution list. Following today's presentation, the slides and additional resources will be made available on the med medicaid.gov website. If you have questions for the Medicaid SBS TAC team, please submit your questions to school-based services at cms.hhs.gov. As a reminder, previously presented presentations can be found on the Medicaid.gov website. Thank you all again for joining today's virtual meeting, and we hope to see you again next time.